folks. Good evening, I'll get rid of the little screen thing. Uh, how fitting, what could be more fitting than having a Phantom of the Opera mask? It's not very often get to don the mask again, but uh, it was either that, folks, or bunny ears. Frankly, I don't look good in bunny ears, so Phantom mask it was. So. Uh, good to see you. Thanks for joining. Happy Easter for those of you that have been celebrating Easter. Tell me how your weekend's been. Tell me how many Easter eggs you have consumed. Go on, tell me how many. Um, what have you been up to? What have you been doing? Where have you been? Who have you seen? We did, uh, what did we do? We did an Easter egg hunt. A nice Cadbury's Easter egg hunt. There are other brands of chocolate if you don't like Cadbury's. And we saw some friends and we saw some family and we chilled out a bit and um, what else did we do? We wrote a Tyler song, uh, which frankly is not going to be uh, coming to a download platform anytime soon, but was fun nonetheless. If I, I struggled even to remember the tune right now, but in the moment it all seemed pretty good. Uh, mm. So tell me what you've done. Uh, Steve, one large homemade egg. Homemade egg? Wow. How many people had homemade Easter eggs? I didn't get that. I want a homemade Easter egg next year, please. Steve, Kelly. Uh, done the same as you apart from the song, Leah. Well, you could have been involved in the song if you wanted to. You could have come round. It was a, a real a kind of family rock it out moment. Kelly wrote the lyrics. Mia wrote all the... Uh, me wrote all the chord structure and I did the so-called singing thing. So, uh, but anyway, here we are. It's Monday night. It's bank holiday. Um, I know that some of you weren't sure if we were going to do the Facebook Live tonight because it's bank holiday. Um, so, uh, but we are. And we are because I'm going to take a slightly different angle tonight on a topic uh, something that I feel incredibly passionate about, something that stirs my inside. Um, so it felt like tonight was a good night to have that conversation. Um, so over in our BTFI group, so for those of you that are not a part of the Beyond the Fuck It group, come and join us. We'll pop the link in so you can come and join. It's a group of thought leaders Groovy people, change makers, game changers, action takers, people that want to do more, believe there's more and want to squeeze more out, give more and get more. Um, so come and join if you're not already in the group. And um, I think there's a lot of expectation in actually in lots of groups that are about entrepreneurship or getting more in your life about the whoop de doo end of being an entrepreneur. And that means I take a picture of uh, me in front of my really big house with my really big Porsche parked outside and my happy smiling uh, pretty family that are on their holiday and uh, uh, we have a nice home I don't have a Porsche I do have a very pretty family um, but I think there's that that kind of end of being an entrepreneur which is all just a bit of wank really right it's just um, that whole kind of bullshitty it's all great end and it's all razzmatazz and it's all rock and roll and cool, groovy, funky, creative stuff. And um, I think actually sometimes I get a bit of stick for people thinking, well, surely you play down that end too, right? So you work with mindset and you work with attitude and you're helping people to reveal those masks and strip that stuff away and be authentic. And so therefore, if you can work with other people, then you must be able to work on your own stuff and surely you have no, no shit to deal with. And Actually, uh, that so isn't true, and um, I do have lots of stuff uh, in in my system, in my 45 years of being on this planet that I carry around that sometimes is really tough and tiring and um, difficult and occasionally traumatic. And I think that we miss a trick if we think that for anywhere, anything like the majority of entrepreneurs, it's all the whoop de doo end of being an entrepreneur. I think for, for most entrepreneurs, actually people in business, a lot of people in corporates, there isn't a lot of whoop de doo uh, There's a lot of really tough stuff behind the mask, behind the curtains that we don't ever get to see. And what I want today to be is a bit of, a, a bit of an unraveling of that. Um, uh, there's no end point in it. 
and this evening feels a bit like an uh, awareness raising actually and beginning the conversation with you guys and starting to put my views out there and hear where you are and um, and we'll see where it goes. What well, I'm sure of there are lots of uh, parts of what we're talking about tonight that we can deep dive uh, at other points and we'll look at interventions and tools and techniques and we're not going to look at any of that stuff really. So, um, so we're talking about, and I want to call what we're talking about this evening, mental hygiene, actually. I think, you know, still mental health has such a terrible stigma attached to it. And, uh, and I think a lot of people shy away from even talking about the whole uh, piece around mental health because they're embarrassed. They're embarrassed that someone might admit it and own it in front of them, that, that they struggle and that they find life tough. Um, and certainly if they have it themselves any kind of um, mental hygiene issues, uh, I think we've moved a long way, I reckon. We've moved a long way in the last few years. And I think we have a massive leap to make. Uh, Kelly posted a really powerful short video in the BTFI group today. So go on over and see it about male suicide and the CALM group. Now, if you know much about CALM. Um, but all about male suicide and they've made some models of the number of men that commit suicide in a year and actually the, no the number is quite staggering. I think there's something around a person is committing suicide every two hours in this country and um, so there's there's so much that is still untalked about and we are af afraid to tackle it and I, I want to really tackle it in whatever way we can tackle it. I don't really know what that means but we're going to tackle it. Um, so me mental, mental hygiene is for me about us all acknowledging that we are susceptible to stuff and whilst we sp spend there is a lot of emphasis and time on the physical being that mental and spiritual part of us is so important also to have good health and well-being with it i wanted to pull off a few stats normally i don't have notes and uh, i've got some notes and there's enough content here for about seven weeks so um, hopefully you've got some food and some drink and you're all kind of holed up, ready to stay online for the next seven weeks whilst I talk. Um, but I did pull off a few stats and every time I read, I've read these stats before and every time I read them, I kind of have that moment of going, Fuck, really, is that, is that really the place we're in? Um, so one in four adults will experience mental illness at some point each year. One in four or adults will experience some kind of mental illness uh, at some point each year. And one in four, 25 percent, one in four. That's like there were four adults at the dinner table today. One of us, it's like 75 um, percent of mental illness starts before the person reaches 18. 75 percent prior to the age of 18. Uh, that's the mental illness that we will have in life in some way has taken seed. 10% um, of kids have a clinically diagnosable mental health condition. 10%, this is under 15. So that's, you take your, if you've got kids, take their school group, that's 30 kids. Three kids in that class will have some kind of clinically diagnosable mental health condition. It's just... Um, what do, you, what, do you, what do we do, right? And I know there's, I know we have a massive shortage of therapists and, uh, and talking therapies are hugely backed up in the NHS. And actually that's still, we're still putting sticky plasters over stuff. We have to be able to educate children around mental well-being. Mia has mindfulness classes at school. I don't know how often they do them and it, it ain't weekly, but she has mindfulness, which I think is brilliant. And when I ask her about it, what she tells me is that that means they um, they can sit and read their book and they can have some music on, on their headphones, which is great for, great for doing something other than sitting in a lesson with 30 children talking, um, but, it, but it isn't mindfulness. And so we have to be doing something better at uh, educating, educating our children and their parents to 
be able to make sense of this mental model and really early, really, really early, we're way behind. If we wait until 15, we've got a problem. Um, so one fifth of work days lost in Britain are due to anxiety and depression. Uh, Steve just says eight month waiting list for triage to access mental health services in Dorset. I mean, eight months, really? And I, and I bet that is not the, I bet there are people in other parts of the country that are waiting way longer. Um, one of the things I pulled off earlier is that many people will wait 10 years to get the intervention that they need. And that's not because they're waiting for NHS services, but that is because they are waiting for the right time to it, to it either be diagnosed or to be able to own the issue and speak up. And many people, of course, wait till it gets to a crisis point. They wait till they completely fall off the wagon um, before they can, before the, anything happens, which means they are either, they're forced to have an intervention um, or some, a family member around them will seek some support. So one fifth of work days lost in Britain are due to anxiety and depression. A fifth of all work days lost. So I, I kind of even just, um, anyway, we become, we can easily become crippled and go, it's shocking, it's terrible, it's awful, um, and, and it is our reality, and I, I think we all have a duty to uh, make a dent in it and, and play our part, whatever that is, even if that's looking out for the people that are in our circle, even if it's that small piece. Um, uh, I certainly do all that I can to help Mia uh, manage her mind best, and I find it quite tricky, actually. I find it really tricky, and, uh, and, I, think it's re and I think it's really important. So um, when we talk about mental uh, hygiene and mental illness, I'm talking kind of, you know, when bad moods become extremes. There was a really nice research piece I read recently about um, people that experience uh, more, more bad moods in their life than we would say is average. Um, they are way more likely and prone to come down with some kind of mental illness at some point experience some traumatic mental illness as a result of bad moods. So even just our ability to manage our bad moods, but we're talking those where that becomes quite a regular thing on one end of the continuum, where it's becoming you know, almost, almost habitual, uh, through to anxiety, intense anxiety, social anxiety, OCD, depression, psychosis. We've got real extremes. Um, when I when I had the when I ran the therapy clinic, which I had for a, probably a couple of years or so, um, I'd see some quite extreme uh, cases in there. Actually, that was so I studied to be a CBT practitioner and cognitive hypnotherapy, and and so a whole um, multitude of interventions, which I thought, which I believe was really important because I don't believe one size fits all. But I'm shocked at the way people have dealt with stuff for, or not dealt with stuff but kind of just normalized it and and I think that's a real problem that we kind of normalize stuff and we put the masks on and we build up more and more masks and there's kind of this you know 25 different masks that that manage it I mean we kind of bullshit our way through our existence um, so um, certainly from my background in performance I've seen a real a, a direct a very direct link between creatives and uh, depression um, and I think you know it's a highly competitive industry uh, instability massive responsibility uh, the, the the pressure to perform a lot of perfection drivers uh, the hunger to stand out to be seen to even get a job to get a fucking job 93% unemployed at any one time in that business so the odds of getting work are uh, it's not good. It ain't good. I feel my, uh, consider myself to be incredibly lucky to have worked the, on the number of jobs and days that I did in the years that I did it. Um, and I actually think the issues that the creatives face and many of the issues that the entrepreneurs face about managing competition, needing to stand out, selling ourselves, perfection drivers, the instability of being an entrepreneur, uh, the, the responsibility that sits on someone's shoulders to pay for uh, to pay for their life, to pay for family, but knowing that in that instability place, it's a really, a really tough space and lots of people feeling like they're doing it on their own. Certainly lots of performers that are out there on their own and supporting families. I remember when I went back and did Phantom 25th, 
and I saw some of my friends that uh, I worked with for two or three weeks that I'd worked with on Phantom previously and they were like, I go back tomorrow, the Phantom 25th ends and I've got nothing. And these are people in there, they were early 50s, had a great career, incredibly talented, but no, nothing on the horizon and they have a family to keep. And, um, uh, you know, and I, and they're not in the gutter, but we're talking about this is where this, uh, I think, you know, our mental and emotional issues are sparked off when we're in situations like that. Um, I know a group has set up recently for creatives, for actors, performers, musicians called Talk in London, which is a couple of actors that have gone, there are mental hygiene problems within the, within the creative world and let's create a community where at least people can talk and share stuff and say that it's shit and get each other's back, something quite tribal. Uh, and um, I think that's a brilliant, I think that's a brilliant intervention and we need that where we, where we take some of the stigma away and the weirdness and the oddity and the staring at people because they have some mental thing going on that, is, that we believe is not normal that actually they can just talk and share stuff and um, that they don't have to carry the burden around themselves. So I think uh, spaces like that are brilliant and it's still a small dent. So, um, so yeah, so tonight is about raising awareness. Thank you for joining and being here, whether you're on live. And I know this is, it's incredibly sensitive and I, and I think if you, even if you think about those stats, one in four adults, there's a few people on this Facebook live right now that are, suffering from some kind of uh, mental, you know, mental hygiene issue where they're really struggling with that stuff. Um, hey, Andrew Piper's on. Hello, Andrew Piper. And you're facilitating the talk meeting tomorrow afternoon. Hey, cool. I think, um, I know talk is early days and I think it's bloody awesome. I've got no idea what goes on in the room. Uh, I can only begin to imagine and I think it's bloody awesome. So uh, good work. And if I can do anything to help you or support you or hang out with you or share ideas or make the tea, then I'm cool for making tea too. I make quite a good cup of tea, actually, so, so I'll be there. Um, so look, I'll run some more um, uh, sessions on this uh, around mental hygiene in the coming weeks and months. So what I would love to hear uh, are things that you want me to talk about, angles that you want me to take, um, deep dive so we can do some intervention stuff. Um, and as I say, I'm not going to do that on this one. I'm not going to do tools, techniques and things because it seems a bit there. I think this is about let, let's raise awareness, let's create a space for people in this tribe and within the BTFI world at least to um, share their views and share where they're stuck and uh, talk about things and ask for the help they need and... Um, I think uh, if we do that this evening, I think we are, we're on a good road. And, and, and I do want us to support each other. Certainly in the BTFI group, I see a massive amount of support and love and care and people that don't know each other reaching out to help. And uh, that kind of warms my heart, I have to say. And, and if, that's, if that's even the basic bit that we get from our group and the work we do, then that's a big win in my eyes. So, um, Mental, mental wellness, well-being, mental instability is much more on our media radar now than have, ever has been. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I've seen that some people are going to start posting things that they want. That's great. I'm not. I won't comment on them. And we'll go through afterwards, and we'll capture a list. So thank you, Jonathan. We'll capture a list, and we'll uh, we'll tap into them. We'll we'll do something on them. Um, so um, we've got things like the Ruby Wax book has been out has been out for a couple of years now. She's done her tours, her frazzled tours. If you like Ruby Wax, you like it being delivered in a fairly comical, light-hearted way. Behind it is a very big story, uh, a, a tough story in her life still that she is battling with. Um, How to be a human being is her latest book. Um, so we kind of see it. We see that in the press. We see that in the media. We see. Um, uh, Ant and Deck Chappie, Ant McPartlin, and um, you know again issues with uh, with, with uh, kind of reliance upon drugs, and um, now alcohol addiction and his drink driving thing, and we see all of those, and I know those are just those are media ones that at least raise awareness to say this is real for people that we go, people that always have a smile, Ant and Deck always have a smile, always funny, but there's. There's the dark stuff behind the mask, of course. Um, and when I left 
Phantom in uh, 1743, I think it was. 1743, I think I left Phantom. It wasn't that long ago, but it feels like it was a bloody long time ago. Um, when I left, and I left because I wanted to do something different, and for me, it didn't feel, it no longer felt on purpose. It no longer felt what I was on this planet to do and um, how privileged to be doing eight shows a week in the biggest box office phenomenon on this planet. And, uh, and I think, and it's probably more with hindsight that I understand why I left, was because I was in complete mental and emotional overwhelm. Uh, and I'm not gonna say that that was depression because I don't know that it was depression. I think what it was was just my huge perf driver for perfection was would eat away and almost became uh, unable to balance that anymore and to keep it healthy. So going to sleep at night, running a story about not being good enough. And uh, even though I put one thing right, there'd be another hundred things that in my head didn't work. And uh, the poor, uh, our poor artistic director on the show at the time that needed to kind of talk me down every day. Um, and, uh, and actually it was just an incredibly tough time and exhausting. And I managed to make a decision to go, I'm gonna go and do something else, having no idea what I would go and do and what that would bring, because it was music and performance was all I knew from the age of nine, <coughs> excuse me, so it was my life. And then to suddenly go, I ain't doing it anymore, was um, was quite bold, and to burn bridges with my agent and say, that's it, um, I'm out. And I just knew that it couldn't carry on like that, doing eight shows a week, and the relentlessness of doing eight shows a week, and being on your A game every day, I just felt not able to deliver it. So um, it, emotionally and mentally, I think, um, it just, I uh, wasn't in a good place, but it, but I also didn't, I don't think I really talked about it. I don't think I shared it. I don't think I, it, it, you know, for those of you that know anything about theatre or, or even don't, there, it is still quite a lot of bullshit facade every night of kind of calling everyone love and dear and smiling and, uh, and actually that so was not me anyway. Uh, but it didn't feel like an outlet to go, do you know what, it's really shit sometimes. It's great getting a standing ovation with 3,000 people and signing autographs and young girls from Japan signing their pants and things, whoop de bloody do. Uh, but actually, there's much, it's much darker than that behind the scenes. I kind of then would go back, I'd go, go thanks, sign, sign pants, sign autographs, and go back home and uh, sit and eat a ham sandwich and go, fuck, so many things didn't work tonight. Um, and that was just, anyway, it was a tough existence and we didn't really talk about it. So, um, I feel more comfortable talking about it now, but it is really with hindsight. I think I caught myself and I know that a lot of people aren't lucky enough to catch themselves or if they do, they don't know what to do with it. And, uh, it feels quite heavy duty. Well, this is that I just think I feel um, I don't want it to be a really morbid Facebook Live uh, at all. Actually, I think we're tackling something that is just this is tip of the iceberg stuff, right? We we're, we're not anywhere near tackling the real depth of where people are stuck. So um, so look, I want to explore the concept about masks, and I know in my kind of fifteen years of doing the stuff I do now uh, that. Um, that I've done quite a lot of mask workshops with people around identity and peeling away the masks. And I've seen every time I've, every time I've worked in that way, I've seen something incredibly transformative happen when people begin to release their masks and let go of it and strip back kind of the up close and personal piece. And um, amazing revelations that people kind of tap into and inner power and strength and suddenly something authentic and genuine appears and actually a bit a bit rough around the edges and, and actually it's engaging and there's some warmth and people can connect to it. And um, I, you know, I think for many of us, we spend our life navigating our path, wearing different masks because many times, because we should. So um, I thought the mask seemed, a, the mask idea seemed a good way to go. And um, the, the way I want to do it is, I want to share a few of the, I think, the five kind of key masks that exist that people tend to wear. And I think that 
I think what I think what happens is if we wear masks for a period of time, i.e. I don't know, 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, but the impact on people's physical as well as their mental being, well-being is, um, is immense. Uh, you know, mind affects body, body affects mind. So if one part of the system is in any way in, unstable or unwell, then the other part of the system is, uh, is affected. So if, you know, m m when there is m mental hygiene is poor, physiologically, I think we see that in people over time. Certainly there were quite a lot of stats uh, I've read over the last few days or so around the people with physiological disabilities in mid to, to late life, a lot of them stem from having some kind of mental trauma and mental illness earlier on in life that they then carry around and they never unpack. Um, so, so impact is huge, although it's, we can brush it away now when it's just a bit of anxiety or depression or stress. Or Actually, the, the impact on the system is, is incredible and, and deep. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna talk through the five or so mask types that I think exist. And I uh, just want you just to hold in the mirror up around which masks you think sometimes you slip on. Um, I don't want to know about the stuff you do in the, in, your, in the confines of your own home and what masks you wear. Just what masks you wear when you think you're out in public is probably a much better way to go. Oh. One of them is around the positive persona. I don't know if any of you know um, the programme. It was a 1950s programme called Leave It to the Beaver, and uh, which is in itself a fascinating program name. Uh, but it was a 1950s program where it was like the perfect household, the perfect lady, uh, what's her name, June Cleaver. Was, and I remember, I remember seeing an episode of it years ago. June Cleaver is the, is the mum. And uh, she, has a, she has this kind of, this perfectly pristine house and role in life and everything. She cooks is perfect and the house looks beautiful and the kids look beautiful, but it's this real, positive persona that everything was lovely and everything was happy and everything was bright and everything was joyous and everything worked really, really well and they never talked about any problems and they talk about the flowers and the food and their haircuts. And um, I think a lot of people will end up wearing that very positive persona mask, um, which is all perfect smiles and facade and very much shoulds, because we should play in that way and we should only talk about those things. And I don't think, I don't actually think social media helps us that much. So um, I, I think there is, I look down through the Facebook feed sometimes and you just see so much bullshit of going, is your life really like that? Although you post that stuff, is that what your life is really like? Is that the truth? Or do we put that on because we think we should and because that's what people might wanna see and hear? or because that's all that we want to put out because the other stuff we're not daring to. And I don't, I don't think that means we need to put um, all our pain out across social media. But I, think, I don't think social media helps us in creating a platform for us to be authentic and express and be honest and, and be truthful. So um, one is about the, that very positive persona, the kind of the almost just so fake that um, because we don't want people to see our... Um, imperfections and we don't want people to see our flaws uh, and sometimes we don't want to see them ourselves so the easiest way is just to cover up and pretend they don't exist and um, it's about our ability to be perfectly imperfect and our discomfort with being perfectly imperfect and you know what happens what happens when we start to expose our imperfections what what would it take for for those of you that wear your positive persona mask what would it take for you to start to express your imperfections and because as soon as we start to do that we build stronger relationships and we build deeper relationships and we have a uh, an, an ability then to connect with people and for people to connect with us in a very different way um so uh so that's the first one the second one is uh i really struggle with this one is the kind of the, the whole strong persona which is the kind of the tough it out the fight it out bit is the um, I, I can deal with it. It's okay. I don't need anything. You don't need to help me. And there's that terrible, bloody awful expression where people go, "Man up, man up," or "Grow some balls." I fucking hate that expression too. It's like I, I just think, and I know there are quite a lot of gurus online that talk talk that kind of talk and 
we kind of it's all the be strong stuff and uh and i i just think really do we need to do that there are some times when that doesn't mean that doesn't mean we don't dig deep and we don't find our inner strength and sometimes we just need we're in a situation where we just need to push it through and fight it through i really get that and that's very different to remember we're talking about when masks stay on beyond their time if masks then uh, create a vehicle for us to uh you know, express ourselves and to get ourselves just our foot in the door. Again, I had a debate with someone recently about fake it till you make it. And someone was going, no, it's bullshit. And people shouldn't fake it. Actually, I don't think we should stay fake for our lives. And for some people, the idea of faking it gives them an opportunity just to play with a concept, to act as if, to imagine, to step into it a bit. Um, but the, the strong one is a, is a real difficulty for me. Uh, and, and I know quite a lot of people that play the whole kind of tough it out mask. And um, this is about the ask for help. This is the speak up for what you need. And it's, it's, we don't have to be strong all the time. I don't know what, we've, what problem we've got in society where we go, we can't let others in and we, we have to be strong. And certainly the whole man thing, man up, what's that about? I'm the least manly man ever, honest ask anyone Kelly probably um, but that was well, just an awful expression telling people just to man up which means just says get over it forget your problems just be tough and I don't know challenge me if you think I'm talking shy because anyway so there's second mask which is the strong persona uh, the third one I've got is the um, is it called the intellectual persona and uh, this is the people that I met one actually a couple of weeks ago that had kind of had very much had this mask on. And um, just in terms of better than anyone else, a bit special because they're brighter than others and they know more and they've got special powers and they have a view on everything and they, they believe they are an expert in everything. And I think, you know, this is a whole bit, isn't it, about, you know, do we praise children for their effort that they put in and the way they apply themselves or their results? And I kind of believe that we need to push the um, push the whole effort piece that we that we, that we kind of high five effort and application. And whenever Mia's report comes through, it's always the effort bit. I go, let's look at the effort piece, the achievement piece. A's, B's, that's great, that's really good. And the effort piece is where I want to see some movement and that's all you can do, right? Show up, all of you, show up and um, apply the best thinking you can and your most energy and be curious and then the achievement will be the achievement. Um, I'm just laughing at some of the comments. I'm not going to read them all out because it's going to be a massive distraction for people, but you can read them yourself. Thanks, Steve. Um, so that, that being a bit more special than others, being a bit superior. And there was a guy in, a, in a, a senior leadership team a couple of weeks ago at an event who just had this whole superiority thing going on, which was a bit, look down your nose at everyone else. I'm better. I've got a view. You need to listen to my view. <laughs> it was a bit, bit like shit on my shoe. And... Um, and I think that's, again, a quite, quite a tough one. And so this is when we're not necessarily talking about how we deal with people that wear those masks tonight. Um, we're talking about what happens when we have a need to wear it ourselves. And uh, so, you know, I, I think we're all, we're all special and unique. I don't think any one of us is more special or more unique or more intelligent than the next person. It's all about what we've tapped into and what we've released and what we're prepared to show and share and put on display and unravel um so for those of you that wear that mask maybe this is about knowing that other people might have a view um being more curious to hear others but that's from a genuine place not from a should not because richard tyler said you should because uh, then that's bullshit and it doesn't stand up but coming genuinely from a place that says actually other people may have a view that is different to mine who knows better than mine not as good as mine will be different for sure. Um, so that's another one. Uh, I've got another one, which is the, uh, the uh, I kind of called the nice persona, which is the please others mask, where they will do anything for anyone else as long as everyone else is happy. It's, the, it's like the, the kind of habitual yes. And sometimes there has to be a pattern interrupt of their yes. But everything is yes. Yes, yes to everything. And they're so lovely and they're so nice. 
and they're so helpful and they'll do everything, everything and anything. You just tell me and I'll be there. This is not saying that we're not of service to others and giving. And the, the difficulty I see that when people have this mask locked on of being so nice is that their own needs tend to go massively unmet. And, um, and that's tough, right? It's tough when, when our own needs are unmet. It's the whole, I'm pretty sure on the airplanes they say put your own mask on before helping other people with their mask is because it says if we don't get our own stuff in order, if we don't get our own system functioning and well and needs met, it's Im actually impossible to meet the needs of other people. How the hell do we do that? Um, so for those of you that wear the nice mask, I suppose with all of our masks, actually, there's a bit of work to understand um, for you know, what the purpose is. So how did we ever choose to take that mask? What was the need that meant we took that mask and put it on in the first place? And I think that's really important. I'm not just saying, you know, take your mask off and fling it off in a dramatic fashion and then flounce on stage. No, I'm saying we need to understand what this is for and what this covers up and what we don't want to be visible. You know, in, in, in Phantom, uh, the, the Phantom is, <coughs> you know, this mask hides what he believes to be ugliness, disfiguration, and doesn't want that to be viewed. Doesn't want anyone to see that. So that massive moment of vulnerability when that mask is at first pulled off and Christine sees the face and the the kind of paradox of the ugliness and the beauty and uh yeah so so the nice one uh so this is about servicing your own needs before servicing the needs of others and uh i think this is the small small steps of releasing that mask and the you know one person one habit at a time this is about developing self-love right what happens when we have self-love and self-care and, and that attention on ourselves first before just being able to turn the spotlight on to others. So I, I think it's really important to understand the reason that the mask went on in the first place. Um, so maybe that's one. Maybe that's one we unpick at some point about the choice people make and the space we have to be in our lives to choose that a mask is better than no mask. Um, so the last one, which uh, I kind of had called the grumpy persona, and then I decided to call it the dick mask, which is not actually like a penis shaped mask. Um, well, it could be, I suppose. Uh, but is um, kind of these, the snarly, aggressive, kind of bullying characters. This is different to the just being strong. This is the, you know, this is the, you know, I'm okay, you're not okay stuff the Eric Byrne stuff and the uh, just the kind of stuck in a box where they think the only way to survive in life is to dominate others, is to stick two fingers up to the world, is to put other people down. It's quite a lot I see online like that, that kind of play that fuck you game. And um, it's a bit, I think sometimes, sometimes actually it falls in the whole hustle stuff as well actually, it's a bit a hustle. And it's a bit, it's a bit the fighter in me. And I think sometimes there's a bit of, if we're going to hustle and we're going to find that inner spirit, there's also has to be a balance with giving a shit about other people and care. And that isn't one size fits all. We don't have to, um, we don't have to be like that to get through life. And of course the problem is when we start to play that game of fuck you, if you start to play that game, then of course, people that tend to wear that mask are incredibly lonely and don't have many deep, honest, authentic connections. But of course, if we start to put that mask on, then it, it, of course it sends people away anyway. So people don't want to gravitate towards you um, and it isolates. Uh, but of course the cycle continues. So the more we isolate, the more we do <laughs> in order to have impact. And, um, you know, kind of the more I talk it through, I think, more incredibly sad it is that the mask goes on in the first place and then the only way to survive is a drug, isn't it, really? Uh, it's like smoking or it's like alcohol or it's um, like heroin or cocaine or whatever it is, right? If we need to feed it, 
And actually it becomes the only way we can deal with going outside and facing the world is to put our mask back on. It's very sad, I think. And I, and I get, actually, what I really get is the reason that someone might choose to put a mask on in the first place. Um, I get that. Which I really get that in that moment to survive it, to deal with it, to function, that someone could go, I need to put that on. Because I've done that. I've done that loads of times in my life. And uh, the problem is then when we go, but that's the only way to survive is that we keep the mask on. Yeah, we keep putting it back on. So those are my five masks. So we've got positive, the June cleaver, uh, the strength persona, the strong one. We've got the intellectual one, which is a bit superior and a bit better than others. And, um, and then we've got the nice persona, which is the yes habit, do everything for everyone else. And of course, we've got the grumpy persona, which is the dick mask. So um, which masks do you think you dabble with? Or a different mask, of course, because they're not the only masks. I think most masks kind of stem from one of those places. I think those are the five global masks. And then within it, we've got a load of other masks. So I'm curious to know what masks you think you slip on sometimes. Again, keep it clean, guys. Um, but I'm curious to know. And uh, if you want, for those that want to share, I'd love to hear that. So, you know, I talk a lot about upgrades and uh, our technology upgrades. And I also think there is a bit of, you know, sometimes, and I notice this with technology, that we have to restore factory settings where we go, it's not just going to be a quick fix. We restore factory settings. So we go back to all the defaults uh, and we don't get kind of, uh, we don't get a funky, we don't get funky fonts and we don't get funky images and we don't get funky screen savers. We go back to default, which means everything looks like it is out the box and we have to do that. And then we build it up again. And, um, there's something for us humans about restoring the restoring going going back to factory reset. Because you know what, when we're born, we're not born with our masks on. We're born, we, you know, we have an innate ability to mentally function really well. That is within us. And then we build up all these other stuff, these responses, and we build up stories and we build up beliefs and value sets and narratives and we have role modeled for us and we believe that we create this reality around us if we behave in a certain way. And um, I think there is, you know, where's, where's the factory restore button? Where is it? Where on the system is it? Because I think sometimes we need to do that and we go back to default and we strip the crap away, which means we have to start building up again. Um, and I think there's some real importance in that because <clears throat> we build up all this stuff. I carry around 45 years worth of stuff. I know it's hard to believe. I've got a whole Easter hair thing going on. I apologize. I look a bit like the queen. I actually look a bit like my mother, I think, today, which is no bad thing, mum. So, uh, so restore factory settings. There's, um, now I'm going to tell that I'm going to tell a story a different time because I realise I've gone on ages and some of you probably are like, or waiting for EastEnders to begin. Um, but I do think we have, you know, I think what we do is we teach our we teach our children to uh, wash their hands when they've been for a wee, and we teach them to brush their teeth, and we teach them to do really good basic physical hygiene to wash their bits and wash under their arms, and then they need to wear deodorant and do all those things. But we don't teach them about mental hygiene. Why is that? Why don't we uh, help children learn to be resilient and to deal with the shit stuff and to deal with the tough days and to navigate their own stories? Surely, surely if we teach them that bit, we're teaching them something that is for an entire lifetime. That means they can navigate all of this stuff because I don't know what the world's going to look like in five years, 10 years, 20 years. Hugely different from what it looks like today. I know that much. And we don't know what's ahead of us. So why are we not teaching our children? If uh, There is a school called, I think it's called School 21. I hope it's called School 21. Uh, and I'm going to see if I can get Ed Fido on, uh, actually on a Facebook Live. 
I've written down in my notes. I'm going to ask, I'm going to make a call tomorrow and see if we can get him on here. And they do something very different at that school where they are teaching about uh, well-being and wellness and good mental health. And uh, I think they have a, a GCSE that is now in um, well-being. Um, but it's a core part of their curriculum. So they've kind of scrapped all the bullshit curriculum that exists and doing it their own way gone off peace and it's incredibly powerful so uh, I think we have a duty uh, and I think when we do that what we start to create is a support network and a tribe and um, and, and I you know I, I kind of go where's your where's your tribe where are your where are your people we've heard from Andrew Piper and I talked a bit about talk uh, so there's the tribe there for creatives and performers and actors and musicians which you think is brilliant and what tribe are you in where's your place where someone's got your back and you can talk about stuff and you can rock up and take all your masks off if you want to and um wh where is it for you i mean that's certainly what we create in uh, btfi it's what we want to have and if we don't have that then please tell us i think that's what we have so certainly use that as an outlet and a space where you go as a group of people that will be your tribe, that will have your back. And you can ask for stuff and you can say when you've had a shit day and you can say when you've had a cool day and we'll high five you and we'll kick your ass when, we, when you need it. Uh, but I think having your tribe and your support network is incredibly important. Um, okay, so just one other thing before I wrap up that I wanted to pick up on. I know... Uh, Sandra had asked me uh, I often refer to it and I've referred to it a few times about uh, doing depression rather than having depression and um, I just remember a very a massive light bulb moment it was one of my uh, cognitive hypnotherapy teachers that talked about this whole concept and I remember having a client that sat down in the chair was uh, already on antidepressants but talked so much about um, you know, this thing they have, I have depression. And as soon as they came in, they're like, I have depression. And it was like, because they have this thing, they, they identified themselves with depression. They were depression. It's like, I have it, I am depression. And, and almost to that point of being like an identity statement. And I said, look, when you say you have depression, it means it's something that you therefore, you own, you have this thing. And of course it becomes a great justification for why you do lots of the things you do. I said, and actually what's happened is over a period of time is that you've started to run a whole series of habits, um, mental patterns, uh, physiological patterns, uh, thoughts, thought processes, thought loops. You've started to run a whole series of them. That means your exit point is your mood, your manner, your demeanor is one of someone that is depressed. So that's how you are left feeling, but this is down to a whole series of things that you are doing. I said, actually, I don't believe that you have depression. I believe you, that you do depression. So you do a whole series of activities that your equals, your end point when you exit is depression. I said, so I just need you to have a think of it like that, as though you do it rather than you have it. And it was this moment that actually, uh, I kind of remember it happening in front of me where it was kind of this head spin thing of, suddenly this person was massively freed up from not owning this thing that they have, this label, and a label that's so hard to talk about. What they had is this thing that they do, which implies that if you do these things that give you depression, you can also choose to do different things, which will give you a different outcome. And for me, that's uh, hugely revolutionary and a massive release for us to go, I do it rather than I have it. Because doing it means you can not do it, you can undo it, you can do less of it, you can do more of it. And as soon as we go, we have it, we own it, it's on us, it's like a coat we wear, it is our mask. It's much harder to shed. Um, so, um, so that's my view on it, Sandra. And of course, I'm happy to have a conversation with you about it uh, offline or, or online or whatever you want. Um, so that for me is a, is a real distinction something that we have is I think I talked about it too, too, also in a post, imposter syndrome about it not being something that you have you don't have imposter syndrome uh, it's something that you do you do a whole series of process thoughts um, moments in time up here that happen that mean the activity gives you something that is like depression uh, okay 
So um, I'm done really. It's time to eat at least one more cream egg. Um, thank you for joining on a bank holiday Monday. Uh, I think I've gone quite slow and I think I've kind of dribbled maybe a bit more than I would normally. Uh, I feel incredibly passionate about this. I don't know quite yet know how I make a bigger dent on it and I feel compelled that this is the piece that lights the fire inside me. Um, whether that's individual work or whether that's collective work. And I just think we have some work to do. Fucking hell, between us, we have some work to do, folks. Um, in whatever way, great or small. So um, if you have some ideas of things that we can do, or things that we can do within the BTFI tribe to ripple out, then please, please say, please uh, tell me, please ask for what you want. If there are areas that you want us to tackle around mental hygiene, I know we've got a couple, confidence was one that came up, um, anxiety, there was another one, but I can't remember what it is, so I'll go back through, I will comment on all your comments. Uh, just ask for it, right? So put it on the page, put it on comments here, uh, come and tell me in the group what it is you want us to um, talk about, and, uh, and we will unravel it. And um, thanks, Andrew Pipers has recommended a book. Uh, Johan Hari's book, Lost Connections, about how depression can be normal, healthy response to a life that isn't nourishing. Okay, nice. Andrew Piper, maybe you'd like to come and join me on a Facebook Live at some point and we talk about it because you'll have some great views on it. And I know that you kind of uh, tread that world of um, psychotherapy, the mind and the creative space. So if you want to come and join me on a Facebook Live, I'd like that very much. Although I've never met you, so that's cool too. It makes it even more exciting. And you've got a pooch as well, I can see in your picture. You and a pooch. We love poochies. Maybe we can do like, maybe our two pooches can do a Facebook Live. Anyway, I've gone on way too much. Um, thanks for tuning in. Uh, as ever, this is about action. Although it's talking, I also want to think about how you move it forward. So what's the, what's the tiny adaptation? What's the one degree piece uh, that you make as a result of this? Uh, so what, what is it you need to do? One degree piece, tiny adaptation, small upgrade that just moves you, that gives you some momentum. And that might be an action that moves you closer to being able to perhaps release a mask. So um, good to have you here. Thanks again. Uh, love you guys lots. Come and join us in the group. I'll be back here next Monday, 8 o'clock. Uh, have a super week. Look after yourselves. Big love. Bye.